Hi, 8th grade. How are you? Happy Friday. Uh, this is the last of our amendments and our last of our exploration of the Constitution lessons. Oh, it's been such a wonderful year. A little sad. Anyway, we're going to look at some of the government reform amendments that were passed and added to the Constitution after the Bill of Rights. Um, we're going to be exploring the 12th Amendment the 17th, the 22nd, and the 25th Amendments. So, let's get into it. 12th Amendment. The 12th Amendment uh, deals with the direct election of a vice president and further defines how a presidential election goes. Um, initially in the Constitution, whoever came in second place in the Electoral College election was automatically the vice president. It makes sense, all right. If the president dies, we want whoever came in second to be the president. They were the second choice of the Electoral College and the people. Let them be the vice. You know, it, on paper, it sounds great. But this is all before the political party system of the United States uh, evolved and was established during Washington's presidency. And um, 1796 presidential election was a very contentious presidential election. Adams and Jefferson, who were friends, just threw verbal bombs at one another. And it was a really brutal campaign against one another. And now Adams, the vice president, wins the election. It's kind of the, uh, the scene as the successor to Washington. And um, he now has to have Thomas Jefferson, the guy who just campaigned against him, as his vice president. Just stop and think about that right now. What would President Trump's administration be like if Hillary Clinton was his vice president? That'd be a bit odd, wouldn't it? Well, that was how the Constitution originally set it up. And um, as you can imagine, it doesn't work out so great for President Adams. Jefferson pretty much from day one works against Adams as his vice president as part of his administration works to pretty much dismantle Jefferson, uh, Adams's presidency. And shocker, Adams loses his reelection re and Jefferson wins. Um, his own vice president runs against him. Ouch. You can see why the two of them for many years didn't talk. They eventually rekindle and become friends again and then die in the same day. In a weird coincidence. On the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. I, oh, wow. Anyway, I'm moving on to a whole other area. So 12th Amendment makes it that the vice president now is an elected position. So when you vote, when you're 18, you step into the ballot box for your first presidential election. When you vote for a the Democrat or the Republican or one of the third party candidates, you vote for both a president and a vice president under that ticket. So when people voted for President Trump, they also voted for Vice President Pence. When they voted for uh, Secretary Clinton, uh, they also uh, voted for uh, Senator Kane. Senator Tim Kane took me a second there. Anyway, so you vote for both of them at the same time. You can't have a, you know president from one party, vice president from another. You elect them together, which makes a bit more sense. So this way, if something happens to the president and the vice president has to step in, they're continuing that administration and a lot of that ideas. Um, let's get to the 17th Amendment. Here you see a political cartoon from the turn of the century, which shows a bunch of senators in the pockets of big business, a bunch of monopolies and trusts. And um, during a constitutional convention, Federalists like Alexander Hamilton wanted the Republic to be controlled by the wealthy elite. Um, the original way that senators were came to the Senate was they weren't elected, they were selected. Um, senators were appointed by state legislatures, um, not elected by the people in the state that they represented. And this usually meant that senators were the power brokers of that state. Whoever... Uh, party held the uh, the state legislative majority, chose the senator and every six years. And this meant that it was whoever was the most powerful figure of that party got to be senator. The people didn't have a say in it. The people 
didn't have any way of selecting it. And this made whoever was the senator a lot of power, not just in their state, but as you know from our exploration of the Constitution, if you're a member of the U.S. Senate, you have a lot of power, not just in passing laws. You are the upper chamber of Congress. You can approve presidential appointments, uh, treaties, among other things. So this is a big power, and the people had no say in electing it. Um, so especially if you're like dissatisfied with your senator, there's not much you can do. You can try to overturn the state legislature and hope that it's also a senatorial election year. It it's a, it was a lot more difficult to switch it. And that's why we see early on in our history, especially you had senators that were serving for a very, very long time who had become very, very powerful people like uh, James Calhoun, Daniel Webster, Henry Clay. In 1900 through 1920, roughly, um, the progressive era takes place, and there's a lot of reforms that are put in place to try to stop corruption in business and government. And they felt that giving the people the power to elect senators directly would be a limit on political corruption. That if a senator is doing a bad job in six years, the people have a chance to fire them. Um, and here you see your two senators who were elected for New Jersey, Cory Booker and Robert Menendez. Um, if we didn't have the 17th Amendment, it might not be them. Uh, and they would have been appointed uh, by whoever was in the state legislature. So we were able to vote for them because of that amendment. 